Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to MacKillop United Church on this uh, wintry day. I'm grateful for your presence, and then you chose to be here today in the middle of your day, and uh, as we all gather on our spiritual journey together to grow and be more present in the world. And a special welcome to those who might be visiting today or have come back from an extended stay. Uh, your presence enriches us, and we're glad that you're here. And, and welcome to everybody, too, that's following us on our Facebook live stream today as we gather. Our second reading this morning is from Luke 18, 9 to 14. It's difficult to avoid interpreting the parable in the, this passage because it's very straightforward, even simplistic terms. The parable is straightforward, even simplistic, in part because the dramatic action of this parable is so very predictable, even to those with only very limited knowledge of Jesus' life. Knowing that G the Pharisees are regularly cast in the Gospels as Jesus' opposition, we all too easily judge the Pharisee to be a self-righteous hypocrite and assume that the moral of this story is to be humble. But a parable is supposed to surprise us and make us reflect and go through an inner and outer transformation. So how does this parable challenge you? Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, but the tax collector standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. May the Holy Spirit bless our understanding and help us to live the truth we hear. Amen. Are you uh, ready? It's a parable. So a parable takes us on a ride. And it usually takes us where we don't think we're going to end up. And so parables are sort of dangerous if you really enter into them. Uh, parables are sort of like in the Zen tradition, like they're supposed to be like koans. They're supposed to make us think. They're supposed to uh, break open our reality and, or our judgments. And then something new is born. They're not, they're not supposed to be condemning but they're supposed to find a, a broader view of life and go into life. And so parables are always fun for me. Um, and, and there's not one right interpretation of parables either, I, I believe, but I'll give you mine, and, and it's really of others too. But this parable really has a couple key sort of grand themes for me. Um, it, it, in some ways, I don't know if it's either or, but it's, uh, you know, do, do we um, experience or even hope for a, an inner life of infinite abundance or is it an inner life of scarcity? And then vice versa, the outside world is also that way. A life of scarcity versus a life of infinite abundance. And on top of that, do, do we have a life alone or together? Do we see ourselves alone or together? Well, and with this parable, we have to do a little unpacking, unfortunately. I hope we can do it succinctly, that's me speaking, and timely, but, but this, we need to unpack the parable, sort of like an onion where, where you have, to, you have the, the dried up hard part of your onion that you have to take off and peel off, and sometimes there's a bit of rot there too as it starts to rot and get down to what's good. Because as Christians and in our tradition, we have to sort of be honest that we've piled on to parables and characters in the scriptures of the New Testament that are Jewish, anti-Semitism. 
And we have centuries, if not millennia, of interpreting them in certain ways that, that, that sort of um, make, make it really dangerous and let us off the hook. And it's really easy to do this with the Pharisee. So what I want to do is, in this parable is, let's talk about the Pharisee, the tax collector, the temple, and God, and then put it all back together, and we'll see where we get. Is that okay? So let's talk about the Pharisee quickly. And I, I really want to uh, contribute um, and mention that I'm really re relying heavily on Amy Jill Levine, who's a New Testament uh, and Jewish studies scholar at uh, Vanderbilt uh, Divinity School, and she is actually has if you if you go in her, she has like a bibliography that's uh, really long. So it's, it's this is a tradition. This is just not me pulling it out of the air somewhere, but it's really centered in deep biblical work. So the Pharisee. So what we've done with the Pharisee, and and, and as a church and as Christian people is. We, we often, like we said, make the Pharisee into hypocrite. We make all Jews into hypocrites. We have to be honest with that. The Holocaust did not happen without a basis of Christian theology that allowed it. And so often we interpret, and many biblical commentators will interpret Jews and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and different groups as bad. That we, 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 we say they're bad, they're not good, that Jesus is opposed to them, that they're against Jesus in all sorts of ways. But that's not true. That's, that's really not true. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were like, the, were like Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin and the Protestant reformers of our day. They were seen as upstanding uh, citizens of their community that were trying to say, uh, something positive about their Jewish religion, that God is everywhere. Um, and there's certain things you have to do because it's part of the Jewish religion. And so, you know, so the Pharisees were very interested in Jesus, and Jesus was interested in the Pharisees, and sometimes some of the, some of the words, we have to know that there was, a, there was this, this fight between Judaism and Christianity as it evolved, and their place, but you know, just like I like to remind people, Jesus was a Jew. He was born a Jew. He lived a Jew. He did the practices of a Jewish person. I like to say he even died a Jew and rose a Jew. So Judaism is deeply part of our heritage. So the first thing we have to do with this thing is not see the Pharisee as someone bad or wrong in this parable. Actually, if we were hearers of this parable in Jesus' day, and we were in the crowd when he said, you know, um, to some who trusted in themselves and then gave this parable, there might have been some Pharisees in the group. Well, it suggested that they would probably laugh when they heard this. And you might wonder, well, why would they laugh? They're not offended by it. Well, two things. There is the judging part, but the second part is really key. The Pharisee, as they come to the temple, uh, to pray to God said, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. Well, two things. This Pharisee was living more than the Torah. And so it's sort of a character. It really, this Pharisee is a saint. It wasn't required to tra tra fast twice a week. And furthermore, it wasn't required to give a tenth of all your income according to the Torah. I mean, this is like super generous. This is what Christian pastors want everybody to do to come to church is to give a tenth of all their money. But the Pharisee were, were not required to give every part of their life a tenth of their money uh, as a tithe. So the picture of this Pharisee to the hearers of Jesus' day would be one of a humorous saint. I don't know if you can see this. Probably not. We've piled on so many things onto the Pharisee and onto the Jews, which are not true. So the second thing, then, is the tax collector. And the tax collector, well, is much like how we feel about tax collectors today. <laughs> Taxes, especially in Alberta. We could solve all our budget deficits by just having a sales tax and getting on with it, but... We like to make people suffer in Alberta. Excuse my politics. 
It's taxes. But so for the first century Jew, um, what we often do with the tax collector because of our anti-Semitism is wherever we see the tax collector, we think they're marginalized. So we raise up the tax collector on a pedestal and we lower the Pharisee down. We raise the tax collector up. But you know, that would not be the first century experience. There would be no raising up at the tax collector, let me tell you. None at all. The tax collector was an agent of Rome. They were not an agent of God. Um, and the two could be seen at cross purposes, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Um, the tax collector would probably be presumed to be corrupt because that's even other Jewish writers and others talked about tax collectors being corrupt. The tax collector would not have been marginalized on the margin um, without power. The tax collector would have been the one with power, with status, and with wealth, and probably they may have been a sinner because agents of Rome and tax collectors were seen as each uh, um, betraying their people, and they showed no mercy to anybody else. They often cheated other people, they stole, they enriched themselves. So that's the tax collector. They're not on a pedestal. They're not marginalized. It's not the poor old tax collector that, oh, we should all be humble like the tax collector. No, they're like Trump coming into the temple. Or maybe not Trump. I don't know, but do you get the picture? And then we have the temple, which also in our anti-Semitism, we think the temple was against Jesus. It was a bad place. I mean, there's all sorts of, uh, of racism that we have to face. But for the Jewish people, the temple was an integral part of their life. Just like, you know, what, uh, that the Basilica and the Rome or the, the Muslim holy place where they do the Hajj. I mean, it's a central part. It's a place we went to do rituals, a place to be reminded of your connection to God, a place to be reminded of justice. You know, sometimes things got out a little hand that Jesus got upset that there was a gift shop at the, at the back of the temple. Just much like major, major, major cathedrals have gift shops in them, and we have our little do data machine and we're selling tickets on Sunday. You know, it's like, you lose the point, but the temple was really central point. And the Pharisees weren't against it either, but the Pharisees were out in the country. And it, 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 and it wasn't a place of abuse like a lot of commentators make out. It was a place that was known as one of the seven greatest wonders of the world at the time of Jesus. It was a place where there was a court for the Gentiles to be welcomed, then because it's a patriarchal time and it still happens today, there was a court of the women and the court of the men. And there was the holies of holies, which Jesus sort of challenged that it didn't have to, God didn't have to be in a box. But it, it wasn't. And it was a place where both the saint and the sinner showed up. It's a place where the Pharisee said, oh, thank God I'm not one of them. But in a way, it was a place where everybody could come. And you know, the tax collector to get into the temple, just like the Pharisee, would have had to gone through a ritual purification. And so the tax collector was already purified when they were standing there together. And maybe the tax collector was off to the side because people didn't like tax collectors. They really didn't. But made the, the great thing, um, God be merciful to me, a sinner. So the temple and, 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 and this about God then means is that, that, that there's enough of God in this parable. It's not a parable about in and out, us and them, uh, right and wrong. It's none of those things that we like to do. Because, you know, in a way, we could put ourselves anywhere in this, in this parable. We could be the Pharisees, like in modern day, well, thank God I, I, I'm not an addict. Thank God I'm not at the supervised consumption site. Thank God I'm not drunk in Galt Garden. Thank, thank God um, if when people's prejudice comes out, I'm not at the pride parade. Or thank God I'm not homeless or poor. Um, you know, thank God. You know, all the things, all these things, is, it's like 
But it's not about that. To somehow we're not like that and we're like, it, it's something more. And it comes down to what Jesus says afterwards in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus of Luke says, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. And here again, it's so interesting, and Jill Levine points it out, I'm grateful for her doing that, is that we find once again, even in the translation of this text, it's, it's an okay translation, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not wrong, but it has tinges of anti-Semitism. My father-in-law is here, and he could probably say the Greek better than I could because he studied it since 14. But the word, rather, is para. Para. It's the same prefix that's in parable, um, paradox, uh, parallel, paraclete. And it can mean rather than. Um, but it can also mean because of, or alongside with. So if you think there's something wrong with the fairies and the Jewish people, and you're a translator that has that embedded in your unconscious possibly, it's interesting that you pick rather than instead of because of. Just hear how this changes the, par the interpretation here. I tell you this, so that, here it is. I tell you this man went down to his home justified, so we think it's the tax collector, rather than the Pharisee. Now if we choose the other way to translate, and you have to know your Bible has this all throughout. People are choosing how to translate things. That's why seminaries want pastors to know the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified because of the other. Boom. That's uncomfortable. It'd be much either than rather than one person's good, one person's bad. One's done it right, one's done it wrong. But you know, the, the people of Jesus' day, and even Jesus brings it out, they... Um, Judaism was a, was a communitarian movement. It was a movement of being together in which even they pray in the plural. And even Jesus did this in the prairie to his disciples. Our Father, it wasn't my Father, give us, not give me, forgive us. So each member of the community was responsible for each other. And even Paul, who was a Pharisee that became a follower of the way of the Christ, the sacredness and everything, had this amazing image, the body of Christ. And no one was excluded from the body of Christ. So you remember that famous phrase from Romans when Paul says, if one of us suffer, all of us suffer. And if one of us is exalted, all of us are exalted. You see, the, see the, this is the overall pattern. <clears throat> it's saying something really radical. That Jesus was saying this parable to those who trusted in themselves. Is that what life's about? That's what the West makes it, doesn't in some ways? We trust in ourselves, we make our own way, we make progress, we fix our mistakes, you know, everything. It's like we're so individualistic, but the parable is saying, you know what? The saint and the sinner, they, they came to the temple, they were who they were. We don't know if the, how, you know, if the, there's some evidence that the, that what the Pharisee was saying was not judgmental, but just saying, well, thank you, God, that I get to pray and do this work and I don't have to struggle with these other things in my life. And, the, and then you got the tax collector who is a scoundrel, and, they, and there's enough for both of them. And both their presidents helps him. The Pharisee's good deeds of doing more than the Torah of being a saint justifies the tax collector. Because of. Because of. Well, it's like saying there's nothing wrong with you. 
There's truly nothing wrong with you. We can carry wounds, and our world keeps wounding each other over and over in so many ways we can't talk about it. You know, from our siblings, our First Nation siblings, and, and what uh, settlers and others of our ancestors did and do today, uh, what we do to the queer community. Uh, I mean, so many things. There's all these woundings and addictions, and they're still happening. But those don't make us who we are, or our wrong choices, or siding with empire. That's what it's saying. But it's also saying that good deed can lift everybody. Well, Jill Levine helped me understand. Let's put this parable in a modern way. Do you remember when you were in school or university when you had to work with other people? I, I like to work alone. So you remember when they used to randomly put you in groups of people, put students together. And I don't, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but when I went to university, my first year university, I got a 4.0 GPA. So, I mean, I, I was smart, and I remember, I don't know if it was my microbiology class or, or chemistry, when they put me with this, there was this guy. I don't even remember his name, and I said, oh, God. <laughs> like, it is, oh, God. I mean, I was a self-righteous Pharisee, anyway. oh, God. He doesn't come to class. He barely shows up. When he touches the beaker, it breaks. And I didn't, didn't want my grade to fall down because of him and, and the group we were in. So we overcompensated and we got a great grade. And, and you know, that, and he didn't do his fair share. He didn't, I don't think he even showed up one time. You know, the whole thing. But you know, so the three of us did our fair share. He didn't. We all received the same grade. And, but you know, in a way, the system worked for him. He got a good grade. Is there anything wrong with that? You see, my sense of justice was too narrow. My sense of generosity, you know, my sense of generosity was not there. There's something wrong with him. My sense of self-importance was too great. And I dismissed him as lazy and stupid and not caring. But I never asked what was going on in his life. I don't know who he was. That's the parable. See, that, that's, that's the invitation. Who knows what happened with his life? What, what, what the parable is trying to say is, is that one act of love, one small act of love lifts others. And one small act of fear has its own effect too. And the parable is inviting us not into a, a scale of weighing things and who deserves and who doesn't. But it's inviting us into a way that we are all family on this earth. We are all our siblings, our brothers and sisters uh, living in a community with one another. We're all one big group and we're coming to the point where we have to, we have to wake up to that. It's not us and them, good and bad, right and wrong, haves and haves not, uh, wounded and not wounded, that, that, that we make a difference, that there is enough, that there's nothing wrong with us. Or like this uh, slide, this next slide says, it's on your bulletin cover. The spiritual freedom we seek cannot be found by grasping at retreating to or protecting our perceived safe spaces. Our freedom lies in remaining open continuously, not only to life changes, but also to the divine light within us and others. See, the tax collector was justified because of the Pharisee. Amen. 
Well, let us go with God.